tell me something. What do you know about Wakanda? It's a third world country. Textiles, shepherds, cool outfits, all the front. Explorers have searched for it. Called it El Dorado. They looked for it in South America. But it was in Africa the whole time. Wakanda is being seen as a utopia by a range of critics, from those who embrace the concept to those who, perhaps betraying some anxiety, insist on just how impossible it is. Even setting aside issues of race, and race is definitely in play here, I'm not surprised at the disparity in reception. Utopias are notoriously slippery. People seem to think utopias are supposed to depict ideal societies. Here's one writer. Utopia, defined by Sir Thomas More in his book Utopia, is an imaginary place, an ideal state, a visionary system. And that's in line with the Oxford English Dictionary, which says that utopia is an imagined place or state of things in which everything is perfect. In Wikipedia, it says, one could also say that utopia is a perfect place that has been designed so there are no problems. One could say that, I suppose. It's certainly true that many writers have used the genre to present their vision of how beautiful a society could be if only it were organized around their ideology. Theocracy, enlightenment, socialism, anarchy, feminism. But it turns out to be much harder than it looks. And this isn't just postmodern skepticism or pessimistic futility. The difficulty is kind of baked into the genre from the beginning. So take Thomas More's Utopia. This book, at just about every turn, undermines its presentation of this supposedly ideal society. It starts with the name of the society, Utopia, a word that More invented by bringing together three components, the Greek topos, which means place, the Greek prefix eu, which means good, and the Greek word ou, which means no. Utopia, the good place that is simultaneously no place. And this kind of wordplay exists throughout the book. The name of the river Anider means without water. The title of a chief magistrate, Ademus, means without people. And the name of the world traveler who so praises the superiority of utopian society? Well, his first name, Raphael, evokes the angel of healing. But his last name, Hithlodeus, is a play on words that evokes a dispenser of nonsense. And it gets worse. By the end of the book, the narrator, Thomas More, says that the customs and laws of Utopia are really absurd because they subvert all the nobility, magnificence, splendor, and majesty which, in the popular view, are the true ornaments and glory of any commonwealth. What's going on here? Is Thomas More the author mocking Thomas More the narrator? Does Thomas More the author hold this popular view about the Commonwealth or not? And if he does, why does this sound so ironic? And if he doesn't, well, then what is the status of Utopia? There is, at the heart of this book, a delicious ambiguity that makes it hard to take More's Utopia and since Moore's book is kind of the foundation of the genre, subsequent utopias, at face value. The science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin understood this. Her 1974 utopian novel The Dispossessed bears the subtitle An Ambiguous Utopia, and she opens her book foregrounding that ambiguity with a simple but effective image. There was a wall. Like all walls, it was ambiguous, two-faced. What was inside it and what was outside it depended on which side of it you were on. So even the most straightforward utopias can't escape this ambiguity. There is always an inside and an outside. I'm emphasizing this tradition of ambiguity in utopia as a way of addressing the issue I noted earlier, the anxious dismissal of Wakanda as impossible. They say it's misleading or something we can't have, 
because the representation doesn't take into account human nature or fundamental truths about civilizations. Wakanda's isolation would not lead to the technologically advanced culture we see in the film. In fact, isolation invariably produces stagnation, not progress. But Wakanda's isolation from the rest of the world, and especially from our world, is a convention of utopian fiction. Isolation is central to the genre. At the very least, utopias are isolated from the reader's world. Moore's utopia is located far from Europe, off in the New World, where exotic civilizations could develop without the forces that have shaped European history. But it doesn't end there. King Utopus, the founder of Utopia, dug out a 15-mile-wide channel to turn a peninsula into an island, isolating his country from the mainland. Similarly, Tommaso Campanella's City of the Sun is protected from its neighbors by seven concentric walls. Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Herland is located in uncharted territory, surrounded by dense forest. And when we ran out of uncharted territory, writers still found ways to keep their utopias isolated. The society in Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, the number three bestseller of its time, that society is isolated by time, set in the future. So yeah, Wakanda is isolated from the rest of the world. But it's isolated in a way that pushes against the boundaries of genre. The moral ambiguity of that isolation is central to the plot of the film. Wakanda's king, T'Challa, has to navigate incompatible views about Wakanda's place in the world. Killmonger's rage at Wakanda's refusal to intervene in the oppressive history of colonialism and its aftermath, Wakabi's insistence that you let the refugees in, they bring their problems with them. And then Wakanda is like everywhere else. Nakia's belief that Wakanda is strong enough to help others and protect ourselves at the same time. So the notion that the representation of Wakanda is somehow weak because it is historically or psychologically impossible misses the point. All utopias, even those dripping with sincerity, are impossible. But if that's true, what's the point? What is the use of Wakanda? First, there's a representation of what might have been, absent the brutality and violence and destruction of colonialism and slavery. Again, this is not a literal what might have been. Wakanda's prosperity is based on the fact that they have vibranium, a quasi-magical element from outer space. That obviously doesn't exist. But Africa is a resource-rich continent. What might have been had Africans been left to control their own resources? Second, there's a representation of what might be. This is the Afro-futurist representation of culture, architecture, urban design, fashion, beauty, and strength that comes from a narrative in which the central characters are not wrestling, as was Killmonger, for example, with the legacies of colonialism, slavery, racism, exclusion, and marginalization. So utopias have long been disruptive. Even the least interesting ones, the ones that tried to remove all irony and ambiguity, as impossible as that is, even they were written to challenge the status quo and often drew the kind of anxiety we see in the responses to Black Panther and to its utopian vision of Wakanda. Wakanda forever! Wakanda forever!